Pyrotechnics are a surefire way to make a concert more exciting and potentially more deadly. From assaults and fires to injuries and deaths, these concerts ended in total chaos. Set to the backdrop of the Vietnam War and the American Civil Rights Movement, 1969's Woodstock Festival in upstate New York featured legendary acts like Creedence Clearwater Revival, Janis Joplin, The Who, and Jimi Hendrix. It was a monumental event that has since become an enduring symbol of the power of counterculture. Unfortunately, attempts at reviving the festival have been met with a bit less success in the Peace and Love Department. The first attempt actually came later that same year when the Rolling Stones were slated to headline the Altamont Festival in California. Marketed as the West Coast equivalent of Woodstock, many bands that had been at the first festival, such as Santana, Jefferson Airplane, and The Grateful Dead were also billed for Altamont. Unfortunately, in addition to some incredible artists, the Hells Angels were also hired by the showrunners to handle security. The untrained, unprofessional biker club was far too rough on the understandably excited crowd. Things got so bad that the Grateful Dead, the last act to go on before the headlining Stones, refused to perform out of fear for their own safety. Altamont was a nightmare. It was, it was the exact 180 degrees out antithesis of Woodstock. Meanwhile, the lead singer of Jefferson Airplane was injured by one of the bikers, and tragically, an 18-year-old attendee named Meredith Hunter was stabbed to death. The violent outcome of the supposedly peaceful festival has proven the importance of proper concert security ever since. The Beverly Hills Supper Club in Kentucky had a storied history and a tragic end. Built in the late 1920s, the nightclub was one of the more popular speakeasy and illegal gambling establishments in the Ohio River Valley during Prohibition. When Richard Schilling bought and refurbished it in the early 70s, it served a much more mundane purpose as a dinner theater and reception hall for proms and weddings. However, the occasional concert would be hosted there, and one that took place on May 28, 1977, ended in disaster. While actor and singer John Davidson was performing in the cabaret room, patrons started complaining about stuffy, smoky conditions. Smelling smoke, a staff member opened another room to discover a raging fire in the building's attic. Opening the door fed more oxygen to the flames, and before long, the fire spread throughout the club, forcing employees to evacuate guests. Unfortunately, blocked exits and overcrowding led to panic as guests struggled to find their way out of a building increasingly choked with smoke. At midnight, the roof caved in. Two hours later, the fire was under control, although the last embers wouldn't go out for two days. 165 people died in the fire, but some good did come out of the incident. After poor aluminum wiring was discovered to be responsible for the initial spark, buildings all across the country rushed to improve their own setups to prevent future disasters. Nobody likes paying top dollar for nosebleeds at concerts and ball games, but there's a reason many larger venues have retired the general admission seating system. First come, first serve seating policies incentivize people to rush into a venue as soon as the gates open in order to get the best unreserved seats. Afraid of the possibility of stampedes or fans getting injured, most venues retired the dangerous system by the late 70s. However, Cincinnati's Riverfront Coliseum, later named the Heritage Bank Center, continued their general admissions policy well into the late 1970s. Even after an incident at a 1977 Led Zeppelin concert resulted in numerous injuries and 60 arrests. However, that was nothing compared to what happened there on December 3, 1979, when the Who came to town. According to history, fans had started gathering outside the stadium around noon, hours before the show was set to start. As the crowd swelled, the police were called to maintain order. When the gates opened, thousands of fans stormed the venue, leading to a stampede that killed 11 concertgoers. The band wasn't made aware of the tragedy until after the concert. People have bruises, people have broken bones, people were bleeding, people were throwing up, and the crowd would not move back. Luckily, the city finally banned general admission seating as a result of the tragedy. Although this policy was overturned 24 years later, improved crowd control methods have been effective at preventing injuries and deaths in large crowds. Featuring Iron Maiden, David Lee Roth, Kiss, and Megadeth as headliners, the 1988 Monsters of Rock Festival at Castle Donington, England was a headbanger's dream come true. Unfortunately, tragedy struck during then-up-and-comers Guns N' Roses set early on in the evening. Song Facts says that several conditions contributed to the incident. First, although Guns N' Roses was fifth on the bill when they were announced, some of their hits, including Sweet Child of Mine, had blown up between the announcement of the tour and the actual show, leading to a much larger crowd than what was originally anticipated. Additionally, rainy weather had turned the ground to slippery mud, so an already out-of-control crowd of 107,000 screaming fans was constantly slipping and sliding toward the stage, squeezing those in front up against the barriers. This forced frontman Axl Rose, hardly a veteran of controlling massive crowds at that point, to stop the set on numerous occasions. Unfortunately, his instructions that the crowd refrain from hurting each other fell on deaf ears, and nobody stopped the show. It wasn't until after the concert that the band was informed that two fans, 18-year-old Alan Dick and 20-year-old Landon Siggers, had been crushed and killed. Guns N' Roses was partially blamed for the violence, and the festival was not held in 1989. When it returned in 1990, better safety features had been implemented. 
Monsters of Rock would not be the last time Guns N' Roses would make headlines for a disastrous concert. By 1991, they were one of the biggest bands on the planet, and the public was waiting eagerly for the release of that year's Use Your Illusion double album. Unfortunately, as Classic Rock reported, the multi-year tour for that blockbuster record was ultimately marred by late starts, outrageous costs, legal trouble, and all manner of chaos and controversy. Billboard remembers an early incident in St. Louis that seemed to foreshadow the madness that was to come. On July 2, 1991, Guns N' Roses was roughly halfway through their typical three-hour set when, during a performance of Rocket Queen, frontman Axl Rose spotted a fan in the crowd illegally videotaping the show. He immediately called security's attention to the bootlegger, but when nobody responded, he dove into the crowd himself. After punching the man in the face and climbing back on stage, a fuming Rose announced, Well, thanks to the lame-ass security, I'm going home. Rose proceeded to smash his mic on the floor and storm off stage. In response, thousands of infuriated fans ripped the brand new Riverport Amphitheater to pieces. While staff cowered backstage, video screens were torn down and brawls broke out between fans and police. Unable to control the crowd, the police ultimately retreated. Dozens of people were carried out on stretchers, and Guns N' Roses was banned from St. Louis for years. The original Woodstock was one of the most celebrated cultural events of the 20th century, and we've already seen how hard that energy was to replicate. Woodstock 99, an attempt to recapture the legendary ambience of the original, ultimately made history as well, but for entirely different reasons. The numerous disasters that occurred throughout the run of the festival cannot all be cataloged here. However, it's safe to say that putting a few hundred thousand kids on a shadeless tarmac in sweltering heat without providing adequate water and plumbing was a dangerous concept in itself. However, as Netflix's train wreck Woodstock 99 documentary highlighted, the festival runners failed to hire adequate security and did not account for the fact that the bands they booked were notorious for getting crowds to go nuts. I mean, this was not the hippy-dippy Woodstock 69 lineup. This music has a lot of rage. After three days of literally riotous sets by 90s alt-rock legends like Korn, Limp Bizkit, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, the crowd of more than 250,000 lost all sense of composure. Fires were set, infrastructure was wrecked, fights broke out, and dozens were seriously injured. For a few hours, no one was in control as the small city's worth of unbridled energy was unleashed in all its ugliness. When the smoke cleared, not only did the area look like a battlefield, but multiple people reported being sexually assaulted during the mayhem. Hair Metal Vets' Great White didn't have quite as much of an impact on pop culture as some of their peers, but they still managed to make rock history in an unexpected and sadly tragic way. According to Ultimate Classic Rock, tragedy struck the band while they were performing at the Station Nightclub in Rhode Island on February 20, 2003. During their first song, road manager Daniel Beakley fired off pyrotechnics that caused the soundproofing styrofoam above the stage to ignite. The flames rapidly spread out of control. When they were finally put out, an unimaginable 100 people had died, and twice as many had been injured. Great white frontman Jack Russell, who clearly had no idea their standard theatrics would cause so much death and mayhem, remains crushed by the events that have come to define his band more than their music ever did. Speaking to Brave Words on the 10th anniversary of the fire, Russell stated, My heart aches for all the families and friends of the victims whose lives will forever be changed by this terrible tragedy. I too lost many friends that night, but I can't begin to equate that loss to the loss of a family member. For what it's worth, you have been in my prayers and always will be. Throughout the 90s, Texas group metal pioneers Pantera flew the metal flag high. By the 2000s, they were bona fide legends of the genre. Unfortunately, while many classic bands have toured off and on over the years, Pantera can never get the boys back together for a full-blown reunion. Drummer Vinnie Paul died of heart disease in 2018, but the door on a proper reunion was shut 14 years earlier when his brother Dimebag Daryl Abbott was killed on stage right in front of him. According to Loudwire, on December 8, 2004, Dimebag and Vinny were touring with their new group Damage Plan. Just two shows shy of a holiday break, they stopped at the El Rosa Villa Club in Ohio. The brothers did some shots and goofed off backstage while the opening act finished up their set. When it was their turn to perform, they had barely started the first song of the night before Nathan Gale, a former Marine, emerged from the crowd and opened fire on the band with a 9mm. He managed to kill four people, including Dimebag, before taking Vinny's drum tech hostage. Luckily, a police officer arrived quickly and managed to dispatch Gale before he could do more damage. Sadly, it was too late to save Abbott. Reportedly, Gale blamed the guitarist for Pantera's split and decided to make a reunion impossible in the most irreversible way. In what then-French President Francois Hollande described as an act of war, terrorists killed 130 innocent people in a string of deadly attacks across Paris on the night of November 13, 2015. The most infamous incident was a mass shooting that rocked the packed Bataclan nightclub, where rock band Eagles of Death Metal were in the middle of a set. Surviving witnesses told the BBC the gunmen, who were also decked out in suicide vests, loudly condemned the French meddling in the Middle East before spraying the club with machine gun fire. Concert goers hid and made attempts to escape the venue until French police arrived at the scene. 
Moments later, one of the gunmen was shot and the other two detonated their vests. Because I was looking through the curtain yeah. and the shit I saw yeah. made me unable to even yeah. move, man. In total, 89 people were killed in the nightclub and more than 100 were hospitalized with grave injuries. In response to the attack, Eagles of Death Metal published the statements on their Facebook page that read in part, while the band is now home safe, we are horrified and still trying to come to terms with what happened in France. Although bonded in grief with the victims, the fans, the families, the citizens of Paris, and all those affected by terrorism, we are proud to stand together with our new family, now united by a common goal of love and compassion. In the deadliest terrorist attack in the UK since the 2005 Metro bombings, a suicide bomber killed 22 and injured 130 at Manchester Arena, immediately following a performance there by Ariana Grande on May 22, 2017. According to history, after the explosion, while 60 ambulances and 400 police officers helped dig through the wreckage, friends and family of attendees were still scouring social media for any information about the status of their loved ones. Grande, who had exited the stage when the blast went off, was understandably devastated and shaken, tweeting her condolences to the many fans and families who suffered from the tragic attack. However, Grande didn't just stop at kind words. Just days after the deadly attack, the singer was back in Manchester to visit fans in the hospital. A few days later, she hosted the One Love Manchester Benefit concert to aid victims of the attack and families that lost loved ones in the tragedy. Travis Scott seems to have a knack for inciting rowdy behavior at his concerts. ABC News reported that the sicko mode rapper has had numerous run-ins with the law because of his tendency to create dangerous crowd conditions. Throughout his career as an artist, Scott has made a habit of inviting fans to jump barricades. And according to the US Sun, he even encouraged a concert goer to jump from a balcony at a 2017 concert. However, the most tragic incident involving Scott so far was at 2021's Astroworld Festival. On November 5th, festival attendees were already sustaining injuries due to the unruly crowd hours before Scott was set to perform. By the time Scott took the stage, the crowd was already pressing dangerously against the barricades, and some people were struggling to stay on their feet. By 9.30, medical staff were beginning to respond to reports of unresponsive trampled concertgoers, while survivors reported screaming for their lives as they fell beneath the surging crowd. While Scott did stop the show a few times, he continued his performance even after ambulances arrived. By the time the show finally ended, 10 young people had died and hundreds were injured in the human crush. Scott has since pleaded ignorance about the true danger in the crowd. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact RAIN's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE-4673.